Hi, I'm Ann Steckel with California State Chico, and I'm with the Technology and Learning Program. Today I'm here with Dr. Cindy Radican from the Child Development Department, who's going to tell us about uh, doing student presentations online with a product called Wimba and another product called Google, which um, specifically we're talking about Wimba voice presentation and Google presentation. Um, interesting process here because what we had was a group of students who needed to do a presentation to their entire group, but time was running out, right, Cindy? Right. We just didn't, have, just didn't have enough time to do this, so we needed an alternate way for students to deliver the content, still have a rigorous presentation for others to see, and I believe, if my memory um, is correct, they also had to do a peer review, right? That's right. Okay, so we did not only a presentation, but also a peer review. And Cindy's going to tell us a little bit about that process and how successful she was and what people can do if they want to replicate this themselves. So go ahead, Cindy. Thank you, Anne. Okay, I'm here to talk about a process that we worked with TLP for our course, which is called Child Development 492. It is a senior internship, and it has a unique design. This is a, a, it's a class that was developed in the last 10 years, but the way this course has always been designed from the beginning was four online sessions, I mean, four in-class sessions, weeks one, two, three, are face-to-face, -face. and then we stop meeting in the classroom uh, th up until week 11, and then we meet one more time week 11, and then we go back and meet online through week 15. Part of this is because this course is an internship, and so it's designed for them to spend six hours a week in the field, So, and, and so we didn't just spend three hours sitting in a, in, a, in a classroom when a lot of this work transferred. We also had a real commitment as we graduate our seniors in child development to teach them other ways to transfer information besides standing in front of a group on Tuesday at 2 o'clock because one of their important, you know, learning uh, criteria is for them to learn things that are sustainable out in the community. What, what we initially did for, for the first eight or nine years that we did this course is that week 11 when we came back together, the whole purpose of coming back together was for them to share information about their internship with the other 40 students in the class. Because it's very difficult to have this really profound internship experience. And when they do their online and journaling work with each other, they do it in small groups. So as to, as to commit, small, or as to, to communicate within just really small groups. But there never was a chance for the other 37 students in the class to really hear what, they're, hear what they were doing, and the range of internships is profound. It goes all the way from Habitat, to, uh, Habitat for Humanity to prisons to schools to hospitals. They're all over the place, and as seniors, many students still need career ideas and those kinds of things, so I felt like we were really losing something if the small communities weren't able to share their experiences with the larger course. So we would bring them together in week 11, which was difficult because many of them had already, they had to cancel their internship time to get there. And what we did was we had them provide poster presentations, just like the old fashioned science threefold um, boards. And we provided those and they, they basically did a PowerPoint and then just put it onto the science poster and then they would walk around the room. And to be perfectly honest with you, even though we had three hours, I still never could figure out a good way if we had half of the students walking and half of the students presenting because we wanted discussion and we wanted them to give feedback. And then we switched places. The students still could never figure out <laughs> how to see the other students of the other 19 students who were presenting at the time they were talking about it. We never really had a great solution of how to use those three hours adequately to meet our learning objective, which was for students to communicate to other people, practice talking about their internship, and to also give feedback. So, and then another thing that happened was there were other things we needed to do, to do during that one meeting time. There were other things that almost took priority. So we stopped having to be able to use the whole three hours. And at that point in time, both staff or faculty and students were really feeling like we weren't meeting that learning objective of really communicating for each student their internship experience to other people. Um, 
So we've started to change with needed, and I'd learned from previous experiences with TLP not to assume what the change was before I went. <laughs> and instead, I just scheduled a time with TLP to really discuss what my issues were and to see if we could come up with a solution. Um, and one magical thing that happens when you go talk to the technology folks on campus is they ask all the right questions, which helps you, even the process of asking questions helps you think about things differently. So I met with Ann Steckel. We thoroughly reviewed, do you remember this, Ann? We thoroughly reviewed my objectives, what the, what the important components were, what things were that we could let go of without feeling like we lost something essential. And basically, we, I liked the process. I just wanted to duplicate the live, you know, poster presentation with something that could be online and at the same time find a way for students not to have to go so quickly, you know, and to try to see 20 posters, you know, in an hour and then, and to also have some kind of quality control of the peer feedback. So this is what we did. And the first time we did it, which was just last semester, we're, quickly approaching the second time with this group is Anne worked with us in the classroom to help us with this process. So the first step now and then hasn't been changed and that it begins with students writing a research-based paper on their topic. So for instance, a student who's working in labor and delivery at, for their 72 hours picks a researchable topic such as circumcision um, in order to focus some research on. And then the paper that they produce because we're trying to make it applicable to a larger population than just child development majors, introduces, it becomes introduced with the topic of circumcision, then begins to talk about advantages and disadvantages. And this particular person that I'm thinking of chose, you know, if, is it mandatory? Should parents be more involved in the process of, of deciding, you know, having input into that process? She brings her research into it, and then she begins to talk about her internship, where part of what she did was to prepare babies for that process. And so they, they have graded still in a, this senior course their research project, and then they get feedback from the faculty member on, you know, accuracy and those kinds of things. That process doesn't change. Based on that, we began changing from step two. And step two was moving from the physical poster that incorporated the research information with the internship experience. Um, Anne asked us to start by just having the students transfer that information into a PowerPoint presentation. And students knew how to do that, although there were workshops available. We didn't have to spend any class time since at that point in time we were online. I just let students know about if they needed assistance with PowerPoint, they could talk to student computing. And in a particular week, which I think was a week 11 of the course, students were instructed to take the feedback from their graded research papers, take the guidelines for the poster presentation, and to come to class with the PowerPoint presentation completed. Initially, we were supposed to meet in a computer lab, but somehow or another, it got confusing, and we ended up doing this in a classroom, which amazingly was successful. So on the designated date, the students arrived in class. There were 40 students with PowerPoints, and at this point in time, almost all students have laptops, and you know the classrooms have wireless capacity. So Anne described the process of the students taking their PowerPoints and transferring them into a Google Docs presentation and publishing them. The process that we're doing, we're doing this process in order to get information uploaded onto Vista. So I have a multi-stepped a multi research-based assignment as a Word document, which is available to anybody who would like to see it, that describes in writing the steps that were taken for the students to take their PowerPoints and make them into Google presentations. Um, it wasn't complicated. I was learning it at the same time as the students were, and I was also taking notes and putting the, the text available on, on Vista. The students were instructed by Anne also to um, keep them in editing form and to send them to the instructor um, as well. So they sent them to themselves and they, they shared them with a the faculty member in, their, in, in edit format. They shared the link. They shared the link. <laughs> this is still kind of new. This is going to be my second time. So they, they sent the link to me, and I got it through my campus mail. I got it. All faculty have, what do we call it, Google Mail, which I hadn't ever used. But for this particular assignment, 
that's how the students sent me their presentations. Now, after I received the Google Docs presentations, the link of the, just the link of the Google Docs presentation, I was able to post them into our Vista course. And, and Anne worked with me. You, we set up a Wimba site, and then I posted all of those 40 links into that area on Vista. So now the students have access to both theirs and the other people's um, links for their Google presentation. Then comes the next important part, because we don't want people just looking at each other's presentations. We want audio feedback. So now there was some instruction. And Anne provided this all in just one setting, but students were given instruction on accessing their presentations, which were in Google Doc format, which were now uploaded onto Vista. And they were given instructions, and there was also a practice area on how to give a voice overview of their presentation. So, so what would happen, and, and they needed a headset to do this with a microphone, and that was explained in the beginning. We also have things that they can check out at, in our department office if they need that. So the students would keep going. We have a question here, okay. and I just want to address it so we don't have any confusion. Um, what we oh. use here at Teach Chico, we use Blackboard Vista, but we also use a companion plugin called Linda um, that was specific to this particular um, adventure with Cindy. is called Linda Presentation or Voice Presentation. That is where the audio comes in. Um, Google Docs, in terms of Google Presentation, does not have an audio component or voice component. So what we did is we imported the links into Moomba presentation, which requires an uploaded uh, document, which was our stumbling block before. And Google Docs allowed us to publish those presentations, specifically keeping it within the CSU. So only students from the CSU were allowed to see the document. And the students then did their audio recording or their voiceover mm -hmm. on top of their own presentation. And then the rest of the students came in to do the peer review. Right. Okay, and now we'll take So what happened with students, and of course students were really kind of anxious about speaking. It's like looking at yourself on, on video. They were anxious about hearing their own voice. So Anne spoke, talked them through with that and, and created with me when we worked together to design this a practice area. And there were some, some very specific skills, like if you push stop, it starts it over, so you have to learn how to push pause if you want to take a break, and she gave them some very specific instructions on how to record over their presentation. But basically, the task was just to go through each slide of their presentation, which looks very much like a PowerPoint presentation, and speak as if someone were standing in front of them. I think we made a maximum time of maybe four minutes, and most of them were probably like three minutes at the very most. Um, students were anxious about the process, but I had zero students who even had a question about how to do this and no refusals or anybody reporting that there was a problem. I don't think they, you know, at first, I think it was first it was something new and when you hear your own voice, it feels a little funny. And some of them didn't listen back to their own presentations. But, you know, and some of them had to start over again because they pushed stop instead of pause. But this is all just normal kinds of stuff that we do. So they were on their own. They had a week. And this has to be carefully uh, choreographed because they have to have it to me so that I can post it. And it's still not ready yet because they haven't put their voiceover. So then they have a voiceover. Then at a certain time, which is, I think, week 14, it opens up with presentations and voice. Um, audio through the whole presentation. So when you click on the circumcision um, presentation, you see Melissa's work and you hear Melissa's voice. And, and the wonderful thing about this is she isn't just talking through her PowerPoint. When she gets to the slides that talk about their internship, it's very rich because now they're just not reading their PowerPoints. They're actually getting to talk about their experience and how it related to their research. So we really get away from this you know, reading their slides kind of a problem. And so it was able to be graded on a couple of components. Then they had a week to respond, and I choreographed who they responded to, like group one viewed group two, who group viewed three. But they were then expected to go review all of the 40 presentations, but to verbally comment and give peer feedback on several of them. We used to do this in writing. 
it was in this really short week 11 period and people just would scribble a couple things on a piece of paper, you know, and make sure that they got credit for it. And then they'd throw them on the desk and everyone out. And, you know, there really wasn't anything significant. But this time I was able to, because there was no time pressure, they had a week to view and give feedback on three presentations. And I was able to structure it much more saying what they needed to give feedback on. The feedback was really significant, helpful, and the students could listen to it at their leisure, and it, and it was there for them. So I think as far as, you know, the value to the student, it was enhanced incredibly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, because it, they had more time to do it, did you, did you find that they might have listened or, or commented on more than three? Oh, they, they did. I know that they looked. You can kind of see who's there. They were looking at at all of them. So they definitely, I don't know, I think they looked at each other. So I don't know that if they actually commented, but they definitely learned. So not only did the person who made the presentation get feedback from people, but the people who were giving the, giving the feedback also saw way more than they would have usually done. And I think at this point in time, graduating seniors, I think they need all the stimulation they can about career options. So they might have be on a credential, teaching credential path for elementary, but then in this presentation, they hear this three or four minute presentation on working in the police department with first offenders, and it's like, wow, I had never thought about that. So it's, it's, it, it could be pretty profound in the way that they influence it, because there's just no way in class time to really have people understand what other people are doing in those internships. So... Um, that that's the assignment we've only done it once and we did it with Anne holding our hand the whole way although Anne, I'm not sure how much time you had a lot of time with me trying to walk me through it and then you had a session with the students and it wasn't even in a computer lab we had zero students reporting technical problems now some of them might have called student computing but there was and I was afraid there would be a big problem with students not having access to a um, the microphone, but and, and actually our student computer labs don't have them. When I checked it out on campus, only the foreign language lab has microphones. So we bought a couple. They're not expensive, and we put them in the department office, and students checked them out, and it wasn't an issue, and we had 100% participation. So we were doing it again. We're going to try to do it by ourselves this time, so we're very nervous. But I think it's going to be okay, and if it's not okay, we know who to call. <laughs> Well, thanks, Cindy. You're welcome. For coming in and talking to us. Would anyone like to ask a question? Well, Tanya, uh, would you like to ask a question? I, I'd like to make a comment, and I, I would just like to say, Cindy, kudos to you for, for seeking out um, at least um, asking some questions about can technology help us in mm -hmm. this situation and what can be done. And together we end up coming up with some good solutions. But uh, you know, Anne, Anne wouldn't be able to give you those great solutions if you didn't ask the right questions to begin with. So it really depends on what are the needs that you have for your students mm -hmm. and what are those student learning outcomes that you're trying to achieve, and then we can figure out maybe the best way. And it turns out when we become more efficient, it's more fun for the students, but it, it tends to, to grow, whether it's more rigorous, whether it's more participation, uh, or more fun of all of them. I agree. I agree. I'm excited about it. And I have a question for you. Sure. So will you ever go back to a physical poster session with 40 students, <laughs> each doing one minute about their... No, I, I, I never... We didn't do it well when we were doing it. <laughs> so, no, I think, I think this, is the, this is the new way to present information. It's more respectful of students. The thing that bothered me most about the poster session was even though we were trying to provide arena for them to demonstrate their knowledge, it, it wasn't done in any kind of a way that honored their presentation at all. It was noisy. People were trying to get their points by providing feedback. The questions were, you know, surface level. I, I just, I just think it's almost disrespectful in those things. And in this one, it's theirs, you know, and people can listen to it as long as they want. And I feel like they really feel that sense of accomplishment after a presentation. It I, isn't quite as anxiety-producing as standing in front of a group either. I think that <laughs> yeah. students get nervous about that too. So I think they can do this recording, you know, in the privacy of their, you know, office or wherever they're working, and they don't have to, at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday, be ready to go. Mm-hmm. 
Um, okay, I'm just going to put a, a little list on the end of this okay. in case anybody's questioning. These are the products that we used. We used uh, Blackboard Vista, and that was where the Wimba product lived. Mm -hmm. And the product that we used through Wimba was called Wimba Presentation or Wimba Voice Presentation. Wimba Voice Presentation allows for live surfing on the Internet with an audio voiceover. And what we were doing is we weren't actually using a web page in this case. We were using Google Docs as our pseudo web page. And that was one of the stumbling blocks we always had with Wimba Presentation because you could only use things that were already uploaded onto the net. And people don't always have a very easy and convenient way to upload a PowerPoint presentation. I know myself. If I didn't have a specific spot to put it, it's how do you share that kind of content. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of Google Docs coming to Chico and allowing us to use it with our students here, it really opened it up because you can publish Google Docs and come up with a URL in literally 10 seconds. Wouldn't you say, Cindy? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. about that long. And so what we did is we put the URLs of the published presentations and put them into um, the Wimbo voiceover or the voice presentation. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, I guess we should say we also use PowerPoint because that was very familiar to the students, and that's one of the things that I like in my consultations is at least to provide one element of the assignment that's familiar to people so that everything is not new, so that way anybody who has a little bit of trepidation about mm -hmm. the technology at least has that one thing to hang on to that they know how to do, and they can at least maybe get them started on the project. Because I know when I met with your students, and they all had their PowerPoint presentation sitting there, I said, well, guess what? I, I have great news for you. You have your work done. And they looked at me, and they were like, you do? And I said, yeah, you've only got just a little bit of step to take now. And then I showed them where it was, and I showed them how to do it. And within two or three minutes, we had some class leaders emerge mm -hmm. who were willing to help the others. And as soon as the students said, oh, we're just going to take PowerPoint, and we're going to put it into Google Docs, that's it? I'm like, yeah, that's it. And then the light bulb went off in their head, and they're like, we can share all sorts of stuff like this. Mm -hmm. We can collaborate. We can check each other's work. And it just was really um, – a pretty amazing activity to watch because students who, who didn't think they were very techno mm -hmm. became really techno very quickly. So I uh, applaud you on that because you have a really nice atmosphere in your classroom. Oh, good. It's fun. Appreciate that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think that's all we're going to have from uh, Dr. Radikin today. Thanks once again for coming to our tilt session here at CSU Chico and the Technology and Learning Program. And be sure to tune in on Wednesdays to see the rest of our presentation. Yay, you did it. Thank you.